Under the quiet night sky, a Japanese samurai awaits the approaching group of men. At a moment's notice, this samurai comes to confront the group, who immediately stand guard to protect their master. Samurai Raizu makes his thunderous and lethal attack, cutting down all of his targets, including his father-in-law. Reizu pays respect to the older man before making his escape. In his final few moments of death, Elder Hirata leaves a message for his mission to continue in the lives of others while he bites down a gold coin. The recipient receives his message upon recovering his dead body. After this killing, Reizu tries to remain inconspicuous from the public eye and hides under a bridge. Usui Yuen startles the samurai with his sudden appearance and introduces himself. Raizu is skeptical of him and inquires about Usui's purpose. Usui explains that he is the jack of all trades for a merchant and deals with all kinds of work. He claims that there has been a rumor surrounding a particular samurai passing his days under the bridge, which is why the locals have hired him to look into the matter. Usui questions why someone like Raizu, who is not afraid of making his identity known, wouldn't be sleeping in an inn. He wonders if Raizu doesn't like people. Raizu confesses that he has actually killed a man, committing a taboo. USUI isn't the least bit surprised and bluntly tells him that his place of hiding isn't the best choice. Reizu claims that he was ordered to take the man's life, leaving him no choice but to obey. In his mind, Reizu believes that he did his job by disposing of a traitor to his clan. Because it was someone important to him, Reizu no longer felt the courage to show his face to the ones who knew his target. USUI provides him with insightful advice and inspires Reizu to take a step out of the shadows. Reizu wants to leave town and tells Usui that there won't be a bothersome samurai like him anymore. The samurai arrives just outside the beautiful view of the city, glancing at the sights for the last time. Reizu is confronted by Matsumini's underlings and wonders if they are to escort him. The men congratulate him on his swift assassination of his father-in-law. Reizu doesn't think much of the kill, claiming that he just got rid of someone who dirtied their hands by trading opium. In a sudden twist of fate, the men immediately hold him at gunpoint, claiming that they no longer have any use for him. Reizu doesn't know why he is being treated this way and knows he is in a tight spot. A feminine voice calls out to him, advising him to jump if he values his life. Without hesitation, Reizu makes his jump despite being shot in his attempt. Matsumine's underlings believe that he won't survive such a psychotic fall and decide to report his death to their leader. However, the girl manages to rescue him from the river and takes him back to town. Reizu wakes up in bed, his wounds taken care of. He is surprised to see Usu Yuen, the same merchant from before, and wonders if he saved him. Usui reminds him that he is indeed a man of many trades, while Raizu questions the kind of people they are. USUI confirms the fact that there was indeed someone trading opium with the English merchants. However, Hirata was only trying to investigate on his own to uncover the truth. Reizu is shocked, realizing that he was lied to and ended up killing his own father-in-law. Usui also tells him that the real culprit is the chief financial officer, Matsumine, who is the same person who ordered Reizu to kill Hirata. Stricken with immense guilt, Reizu crumbles in defeat and questions why a man like him was even rescued. Usui reminds him that in the midst of all this chaos, Matsumini still remains unharmed. Having caught his attention, Usui tells him that Hirata's final message was to carry on his investigation to settle the matter. Finding newfound hope to correct his mistakes, Reizu decides to help Usui with his mission. Reizu leads Usui's team right to Matsumine's base. He still feels guilty for killing his fiancé's father and seeks to avenge his death. Because of Raizu's apparent death against Matsumini's men, he is declared dead in the city. Later, Raizu lays a map of Matsumini's building and supports Usui's team with his knowledge. Usui declares that they will be ending the matter tonight and insists that Raizu stay put as he hasn't healed from his injuries. That night, Usui and his team initiate their mission to take down Matsumine. Unbeknownst to Usui, Reizu gears up and goes off on his own using the secret passage. Matsumini's place is invaded as Usui's formidable team crushes Matsumini's men. 
Usui himself uses a unique ability, attaching a gold leaf to a man's face before casting his incantation, sapping the life out of the man. They come to discover that Raizu has secretly escaped. Raizu confronts the escaping Matsumini at last and musters all his strength into one sword strike, cleaving the man's body in half. Matsumini retrieves Matsumini's blade and runs off, leaving Usui and his team baffled as they realize that they are the ones who he fooled. Reizu hastily sprints to Yui's place, hoping to give her some relief after his gut-wrenching betrayal. However, as soon as Reizu enters her room, he succumbs to a horrifying realization. Tragedy follows Reizu as the samurai witnesses the bloodied body of his fiance. Yui has just taken her life in grief, leaving Raizu a weeping mess with endless guilt. Raizu relives the memory of the moments he shared with Yui and her father, who respected him greatly. However, that mellow dream soon turns into a nightmare, as the guilt of his actions creeps in, eating him alive. At present, we see a depressed Raizu who hasn't slept or eaten for days, coping with the loss of his fiance. Switching to Yu Suai Yuan's side, he makes an appearance at the chapel, reporting the success of their mission. Even though they wanted to keep Raizu's involvement a secret from the organization, his superior implies that he already knows about the samurai. Yuasui is given the reward for completing their mission. He returns to his shop to distribute the reward to his teammates, who are dissatisfied with what they got. Yuasui also claims that they need to take a cut out of their money for Raizu, who is responsible for dealing with the kill. Soji isn't pleased by this, but USUI reasons that it is better to make Reizu a part of their team for an even better pay rate. In the next scene, we see Teppa tending to his job as a doctor. The patient he is dealing with is a woman who has lost everything because of her husband and his employer. She no longer bears the will to live and knows that her condition is dire. In a final act of defiance against her husband, she gives the gold coin to Teppa, which is a necessary token to summon the Revengers. Teppa leaves the room, realizing that they've just acquired two more targets to kill. Usui Yuen pays a visit to the grief-stricken Raizu, who claims that he doesn't want any reward money. Usui Yuen finally explains that they belong to a team called the Revengers, who act on behalf of those who are wronged in the world in their final moments. Raizu isn't pleased with his explanation, knowing that they kill people for money. Yusui explains that they only do so in an act of justice against those who were wronged. He also shows Raizu the bitten gold coins, indicating the will and desire of the person who wants them to take revenge for being wronged. Usui takes him to Teppa, who has already taken note of Raizu's declining health and advises him to get up to speed with recovery. Teppa claims that the funeral in front of them is of mana, who gathered every last penny to purchase the gold coin just to exact revenge against her husband and his employer. Yusui also adds that the terrible people who have wronged others continue to do the same even today, which is why they take them out. Puzzled by what he should do, Raizu asks to reflect on the matter before making a formal decision. Yusui leaves him with parting advice, stating that he can't return to his previous life after his kills, and that the only way is to move forward. Switching the scene to Inohachi and his wretched employer, Inohachi is startled by his gigantic guard, who is to escort him to Nagasaki. The guard drags him all the way to the boat and claims that his armor is strong enough to fend off guns. Inohachi becomes frightened by the thought of armed men and tells the blockhead that he is the one who needs to be protected instead. Teppa, with his brilliant stature, scopes out his target on the boat. He unveils his majestic armor and stretches with perfect form, exhibiting so much force that the arrow knocks Inohachi's boat completely. Inohachi makes an effort to escape, but the fabled samurai in red is already there. Reizu equips the spikes on his new shoes and makes a sweeping cut, severing Inohachi in one clean blow. Teppa thinks that he has just given Reizu the perfect upgrade. Meanwhile, the scum employer is baited by Neo and proceeds to get his face gold-plated by Yusui, falling to his death. The following morning, Teppa pays his respect to Mana's grave, as they have exacted her revenge. The following day, Raizu explores the town with Neo, who fails to make him react in a meaningful way. 
Raizu keeps his stone face even while eating a delicious meal. Neo takes him to the top of the mountain where the downtrodden are known to live. However, there is a public outburst going around involving Cicada, the merchant who is accused of trading opium. Cicada is an innocent merchant who doesn't know why he is being treated this way. But the officers get the better of him as they discover opium inside a statue. Cicada is arrested, while Rezu fails to understand the situation. Neo tells him that Cicada is someone who didn't pay back his debt, leading him into a mess where he was made a humiliating example in front of the people. Raizu, being ignorant of himself, claims that a samurai wouldn't stoop so low as to do that. Neo taunts him that someone like him, who killed his father-in-law without any questions, is much scarier in comparison. Switching the scene to Soji's perspective, he is greeted by Teppa, who tells him that Raizu will be sharing a room with him. Soji is baffled and continues to slander the samurai, whereas Raizu maintains his composure. Neo and Yuan share a conversation outside regarding Raizu's involvement with the group. Neo wonders if Yuan is so oblivious to the fact that a killer will stop being a killer someday, expressing her distaste for the samurais. Yuan emphasizes that he doesn't believe that to be the case, which is an answer she appreciates. Yuan thinks that Raizu's effort to change his path in life is enough instead of swallowing regret without having ever tried. His explanation baffles Neo. Yuan makes a guess to Isarizawa and wonders what he is to do for him. Isarizawa reminds him of the murders involving Hirata and his men, including the psychopath responsible for cutting them down. They are aware that the primary suspect is the samurai Reizu, who habitually slept under a bridge until his sudden disappearance only a month ago. Isarizawa is suspicious of Yuan's involvement and is interested in his reaction. Yuan continues to feign ignorance of the matter and taunts Isarizawa for threatening an ordinary craftsman like him. Isarizawa insists that Yuan let it all out as they're not under surveillance, but Yuan doesn't let anything slip from him and insults him as the pajama police. Isarizawa mentions that he received a gold coin while investigating Cicada's case and thinks that someone like Yuan is better suited for the job. Meanwhile, Teppa and Neo discover the sickened bodies of Cicada's wife and others. Cicada's wife reveals that she was instructed to plant opium inside the statue in return for some medicine. Teppa glances at their bodies and realizes that things are worse than he expected. That night, they decide to take revenge in the name of Cicada and the others. Soji and Raizu embark on this mission to take down five targets. Being the gambling man he is, Soji plays a game with Raizu claiming that the one with the most kills will get to keep their room. Reizu takes up the challenge and hurries to find the target. Soji wants to play smart and knows that Reizu will probably end up attracting the attention of all their targets, giving him the perfect moment to steal his kills. However, Soji is stunned when he sees Reizu's impressive stealth assassinations. After securing two kills each, Reizu comes to confront their final target. Before he is able to take the kill, Soji cuts him down, standing victorious in their game. Just as he is celebrating his victory, Reizu takes down a man right behind him who is about to attack the gambler. Soji doesn't feel pleasant about the existence of a sixth person, as they now share the same score. The gambler sticks to his word and states that they'll be sharing a room because of this outcome. Teppa comes to share his concerns with Yuan, claiming Reizu's existence to be a potential threat to their own team. Yuan is aware of the concerns, but apparently sees something different in the samurai, feeling certain about his decision as he observes the gold coin in his hand. Soji continues living his life with his new roommate, Reizu, who has installed a special screen for them to ensure privacy. Reizu finishes his meal and quietly meditates until the night when Soji returns defeated from his gambling ventures. Reizu meditates until the following morning and only begins speaking when Soji calls for his attention. Reizu claims that he doesn't want to disturb Soji and stays put for that reason. Soji is stupefied because his roommate believes that this is some kind of prison. Soji wonders if samurai habitually go out to enjoy meals, but Reizu tells him that they never have enough money to do such a thing. Soji is surprised and asks about the pay cut that he received from the job, which Reizu claims he spent on buying the screen for them. Soji finds it frustrating that he got scammed for such an item, 
Realizing that Rezu struggles with even shopping, Soji invites him out, hoping to help him find a job. However, his smile turns into a frown when he explains the matter later to Neo and Yuan. Neo makes fun of him for ever believing that he could get someone else a job when Soji himself doesn't even have one. Apparently, Soji tried his best to get Rezu a job at Teppa's clinic. However, even the littlest of actions scared away his patients because of Rezu's intimidating presence as a samurai. Rezu found no success in the clinic, which makes Neo laugh because she believes the idea of a killer samurai working at some clinic as an assistant was stupid to begin with. Yuan tells him that Raizu probably had some sort of other job in his previous life as a samurai, to which Soji explains that all he did was sleep his days and work his way around the sword. He would also occasionally offer sword classes as an instructor at the castle and come home for more practice. Neo is baffled to find that all he knows is to swing a sword. Neo thinks that she could try her own way of getting him some clients. Soji hallucinates the possibility and finds his face completely flabbergasted. Yuan wonders if Soji found any success with Raizu by the end of the day. We are shown that Soji tried to use Yuan's special painted bowls and pitched the idea to Raizu to sell such items. Raizu didn't understand the worth of such items, but apparently they're considered a hefty price to collectors and merchants. Soji also tells him that their leader's crafts are known all around, which is why they could sell for quite a bit. Raizu tells him that he still struggles with the concept of revenge and doesn't know if he can continue his life working a day job while taking out people in the night in the name of revenge. Soji finds himself exhausted arguing with him and advises the samurai to worry about those things once he actually lands a job. Yuan decides to make an appearance at the chapel. The superior priest congratulates Yuan's group of revengers for completing their recent mission with ferocity. Surprisingly, Yuan isn't presented with a bitten gold. The priest claims that their revenge mission hasn't concluded, as there are more people needed to be dealt with. The priest claims that the merchant Cicada's opium actually came from a middleman, instead of directly obtaining it from the English merchants, giving him an edge over the rival businesses. The priest wants Yuan's group to cleanse the middle party who became responsible for the trades, which happens to become Yuan's next mission. Yuan explains the situation to his group in their meeting place. Soji realizes that the middleman Azumiya went directly into hiding right after the death of the merchant, and he chooses to hide at his mistress's place. Neo thinks it is the perfect opportunity for them to take out the two as his mistress has sins of her own. At first, Reizu has trouble understanding why Azumiya's mistress is also on their list of targets. Still, Teppa explains his worries away, claiming that she was responsible for influencing the merchant's wife, which led to this mess. Yuan's new initiative is to use an art shop as surveillance to spy on Azumiya's mistress, waiting for the both to show up together in one night. At first, the responsibility is handed to Soji, but he furthers it to Reizu, claiming him to be a better pick. Neo has trouble with this arrangement, because Reizu's intimidating stature is a kryptonite to the customers and will draw suspicion. Soji acknowledges this problem and emphasizes that Reizu should act casually if he wants to seek success in this mission. The following day, Reizu works his first day at the shop as the shopkeeper. However, things go exactly as thought, as Reizu's glare scares off all the prospects from even inspecting the paintings. The sight of such a brooding samurai makes them run away. Reizu ends up finding Japanese-style illustrations on the ground, which sparks an idea. Soji and Neo are spying on him just for safety. Reizu begins dancing with his brush stroke on the sheet of paper, crafting an exquisite work of art in his own style. That night, he finds their target entering his mistress's place, which is the green signal for them to attack. After his alert, Teppa shoots a gigantic arrow, immediately mauling Azumiya. His mistress tries to run away unscathed, but she bumps into Usui Yuen, who is waiting to take her out. The Revenger uses his ability to eradicate her existence from the world, bringing their mission to a close. After their mission, the original art shop owner returns to maintain his position. He also pays Reizu a good price for all his work, since he keeps the shop tidy. When the shopkeeper inspects the illustrations, he is shocked to note that Reizu drew such exquisite Western-style paintings. The shop owner is moved to the point where he wants to find Reizu, 
a publisher, which catches Yuan's eye, who knows that this is the perfect job for the samurai. The following night, the Doan Company hosts a festival. Soji wants to go chase his bread but stops himself from doing so because he wants to bet on Neo's kiting competition instead. He finds the samurai Raizu casually painting his illustrations and has trouble acknowledging that a man with killing abilities is capable of gentle yet beautiful paintings. Raizu claims that he never found the activities different, and he paints the same way as he fights, as doing anything in a state of zen or meditation means little to him. Soji mocks him for even dirtying his hands with a blade if he could paint so incredibly well, to which Reizu sincerely replies that Soji is much better at making decisions than him. Amidst their conversation, Soji's sister Hana comes to tell them that both her friends, Weasel and Badger, have gone missing. The next day, Reizu and Soji go up to the mountains where Neo is having her kiting competition. Soji explains that Hana often comes here to visit her mother's grave and has made friends with the kids around. Soji himself believes that Neo will easily win a fortune in this competition as well, allowing the gambler enough money because he placed a bet. However, Yuan meets an unexpected visitor. The man is the president of the treacherous Doan Company, who has come to reclaim Neo. Doan calls Neo a monster unlike any other, which Yuan finds incredibly annoying as he corrects him, claiming that Neo is just another human being. Yuan shuts down any and all advances, leaving Doan empty-handed. However, Neo catches them having a conversation, and because of her distraction, she loses the kiting competition. Later, Raizu brings to Yuan's attention that even aside from the two siblings that Hana mentioned, many other kids have gone missing. They deduce that it is the work of the Doan Company, as they snatch such unfortunate kids and make them a part of their circus. Yuan also explains that Neo was once one of those children, and he is the one who freed the child. Doan, on the other hand, no longer wants Neo in someone else's hands and seeks to reclaim her. That same night, Doan regrets his decision to let Neo go away. However, Neo makes a surprise appearance of her own, claiming that she is willing to return for a suitable price. On the other side of the circus, Weasel and Badger, along with the other kids, are kept in cages as if they were animals. Neo comes to their aid, but knows that she can't free them on her own. Instead, she tosses them a gold coin, aiming to carry out this mission on the basis of revenge. After that, Neo brings that gold coin back to her group with two bitten marks. The group is suspicious of Neo's convenience in finding such a gold coin. Neo simply tells them that she appeared in front of Doan for a simple matter and came across the coin on her own, hiding the fact that she is the one who gave the children a reason to be rescued. Soji backs her up, claiming that they never once questioned the legitimacy of the coins as long as they were based on a grudge. Neo also places the condition that she should be the one who takes out Doan. After all, Neo discovered the gold coin in the first place. While preparing, Neo knows that Yuan is unhappy about her acting of her own volition. She tells him that he should have taken out Doan if he didn't want such a future to occur. Yuan claims that he has already dipped his life into sin and strayed from the path of God, which is why he now stays faithful in the path of revenge. Neo doesn't buy the gimmicks of religious codes and initiates her mission, believing that it is the only way for her to exact revenge against Doan. Meanwhile, Soji and Reizu play the part of distractions and fend off two difficult opponents of their own. Teppa handles the one bearing muscle, contesting him in a matter of strength. Soji creates a distraction enough and uses his deck of cards to fend off Reizu's opponent. In the end, both of them succeed in taking out their enemies and Teppa also defeats his own adversary. The festival blows up in flames, jeopardizing the safekeeping of the children. Thankfully, Yuan throws them the keys to be rescued. Neo confronts Doan and allows him full permission to kill him if necessary. Doan tries his best, but he fails to kill the monster he created. When it is time for Neo to strike, she cuts down Doan in a false swoop in front of Yuan's eyes. After their mission, Soji buys Neo an expensive cake, which he normally doesn't do for anyone. Soji claims that it is on behalf of Hana, who was worried about her friends. Neo tells him that he never even thought about killing Doan and only went the extra mile for Soji's sake because of the kiting competition. 
Soji is surprised that Neo went this far in setting everything up. Remembering his support in their meeting, Neo mouths Soji's own words, claiming that there is no difference in the legitimacy of the gold coins in the end. Yuan and Teppa have a conversation. Teppa also notes that Neo is a unique child who doesn't even have a sense of morality and kills whenever necessary. But Yuan tells him that he wants to protect Yuan and ensure him a life of humanity no matter what. The following day, the art dealer tells Reizu that a publisher has given him the green signal to order an illustration as a hanging scroll. The art dealer also gives him tools of his own to paint the scroll. Reizu thinks that his art is subpar to suit the style of a scroll, while Soji thinks he's overqualified for the job instead. The art dealer reassures Reizu that he is a talented artist with hands that are blessed by God, meaning he is perfectly fit for the job. Reizu and Soji are pacing their way in town when they realize they're being tailed. Soji issues him an order not to kill these assailants. While Soji defeats the two on his end, Reizu struggles to fend them off and lets the other two escape. After interrogating the defeated men, they find no clues as they have no information about the ones who hired them. Reizu allows them to run away. On the other side, Yuan is summoned yet again by Isarizawa who informs him that Azumiya and his mistress also died recently. Yuan feigns ignorance and acts surprised even though it was the Revengers group that took them out. When Isarizawa asks Yuan about Raizu's existence, Yuan once again claims that he knows nothing about the matter. Isarizawa tells him that people in Chinatown are insistent on tracking him down as recently as Hirata's killer has become the talk of their town. Yuan wonders why there is such a stir in Chinatown. Isarizawa theorizes that it is because of the opium investigation that he was involved in. Isarizawa also thinks that it may become a problem for the whole of Nagasaki, as it will also get infected with the trade. Isarizawa tasks him with investigating the reason behind the noise in Chinatown, and Yuan takes him up on the job. Later, Teppa tries to investigate the matter in Chinatown under his guise as a doctor. However, he is met with treatment at the edge of a blade, as the people don't take it lightly for even him to investigate the matter. Following this experience, Teppa returns to his team and shares his findings about the case in Chinatown. Reizu wonders if the people of Chinatown were also conspiring with Matsumine, which is what Isarizawa also believes. Hearing this, Reizu tries to leave, stating that he will save those people the trouble of finding him by making an appearance. Soji thinks it is stupid for him to go off his own with the little information he has. Yuan reminds him that his life could be in danger, as these people share no intention of discussing the matter with reason. Reizu states that his life has little meaning in the first place, as he is responsible for stupidly killing his father-in-law and driving his fiancée to take her own life. Reizu doesn't find his life to be precious, and thinks that even if he dies, it will amount to little. Saying this, he takes off on his own to make an appearance in Chinatown. Teppa, Yuan, and Neo are aware that if he ends up dying as the famous artist and known killer of Hirata, it will massively jeopardize their existence in Nagasaki, since people like Isarizawa will draw a connection. Because of the complications that may occur, the group decides to act in order to ensure Raizu is safe. Raizu pops up in Chinatown, where people are already aware of the samurai. Master Lu and his men are waiting for him. Reizu questions why he is being sought after. Master Lu stares him down and immediately knocks him unconscious with a single attack. Reizu is kidnapped and captured. Displaying his perception, Lu claims that a man like Reizu isn't so much a greedy monster who would kill people for no reason. He merely wants to know who gave Reizu the orders. Lu is summoned for an urgent meeting and leaves Reizu to his guard. Meanwhile, Neo and the others make their move by steering the ship away from the harbor. The Chinese guard beats up Raizu. Soji and Yuan take care of the men, revealing that they have no interest in killing without a gold coin. Yuan shares that Soji has actually grown to become considerate of Raizu, as he is basically working for free. Soji doesn't believe that, and replies that it's for his own preservation from the police. Raizu's torture only continues as the Chinese guard questions where he stored the cargo. Reizu has no idea what he is talking about, which leads to him getting brutally tortured even more. 
Thankfully, Soji comes to his rescue and saves the samurai at last. Master Lu issues his complaints against the man of the trade union because he knows that his ship has just been raided and their captive has escaped. Lu is concerned about why the magistrate and the police, who were previously told to be ineffective, are capable of such feats. The businessman claims that it wasn't really the police who raided his ship, but instead, a group of outlaws who would take out enemies for the sake of a price. These people are the Revengers. His group retrieves Reizu and tells them that Matsumine collected his cargo before their assault. Lu's people captured him because they thought he was responsible for moving the cargo. However, it is now known that an obscene amount of opium hides somewhere in Nagasaki. Returning home, Reizu tries to paint his drawing when he is once again haunted by the nightmares of Yui and her father. Reizu once thought that Matsumine's assassination would be the end of his troubles, and that he was foolish to believe it would. Yuen receives yet another bitten gold coin, signaling their oncoming mission. While Soji is playing with his siblings, Hana comes to ask him if he fought with Raizu since he hasn't come out of his room lately. Down in what is supposed to be a holy temple, a group of monks are assembled at the nunnery, and one of them is confused about their business at night. The nun presents them with a group of women who are actually male prostitutes under the guise of. The other monks are well acquainted with this unholy practice, but Seiku is not only unsure, but also suspicious of the smell of opium. Ichinojo presents himself in Seiku's room. He meditates and expresses his desire not to dwell on the deed. Ichinojo forces himself on him, claiming that they're being watched and shouldn't act suspiciously. In fact, a nun reports this incident to the rest, claiming that their high moralist priest fell the hardest in the end. The nuns operate this cult as if to claim this practice as a holy act. The following morning, Seiku tells Ichinojo that he doesn't have to spend his life this way. He wants him to join the temple, knowing that God will accept him in the end. After Seiku takes his leave, the male workers are forced to inhale their so-called ceremonial medicine, which is actually the dose of opium. The head nun also tells Ichinojo about Seiku's tragic past and claims that he should be the one to bring the man to salvation. The nun injects the medicine into his body, continuing his life of dread. That night, Ichinojo finally bites the gold coin. The monk also returns defeated, having strayed from God's path and no longer believing that he is befitting the role of a monk. The matter reaches the ears of the Revengers, who are surprised that a temple such as this would become corrupted. Neo isn't shocked and claims that only stuck-up people are the easiest to trick. The system of the unholy temple runs by itself, as former customers end up becoming their own workers. They don't have information about the temple's connection to opium and are focused on executing the act of revenge. Raizu sharpens his blade, while Soji wonders why he doesn't let a professional craftsman do the job. Raizu claims that any decent craftsman is capable of knowing if a blade has tainted a life. He doesn't trust anyone to surrender their blade. The night of revenge finally comes when Neo annihilates the nuns. Yuan and the others also invade the temple, while Teppa locates the leader of the nuns. With the stop of his arrow, Reizu comes to confront the lady who is ready to sell him opium, so long as it would spare her life. Reizu gets tricked but thankfully doesn't allow the opium to be injected into his body. In the midst of all this, Master Lu comes before Reizu. Because of this coincidence, both of them think that the other is linked to the matter. The battle between the samurai and the martial artist begins, but Reizu actually feels overwhelmed by Lu's speed as he easily dismantles his blade and leaves Reizu with a bloodied nose. Soji kills their main target, and Lu doesn't have a problem accepting a two-on-one situation. Soji is left impressed by his speed and wonders if the martial artist is even human. The following day, Isarizawa is summoned before the administrator and the Shishido, who is the trade union's appointed overseer. Shishido shares that Cicada didn't really die of any illness and was in fact killed. Not only that, he also reports rumors of the killers who take up any deed for a bitten gold coin. Isarizawa doesn't believe in his words, but the administrator insists Isarizawa look into the matter of Cicada's killer. After their meeting, Isarizawa finds himself bummed out that he has to investigate two different affairs, one being the case of Hirata's killer and the second being the case of Cicada's death. 
Shishido tells him that it might be possible for things to be connected and that by sorting out one matter, he will find clues about the other. Isarizawa has no problems pushing Shishido around, stating that even if Shishido manages to kill him in the process, all he needs to do is bite a gold coin. Shishido tells him that, in fact, he is going to bite the gold coin himself to test out the theory of the killers. Isarizawa is done with his shenanigans and leaves him to do whatever he wants. While Soji is asleep, Raizu meditates in clarity, finding her in his vision, but this time, he is calm. In fact, Raizu finishes up his painting of Yui and presents it to the art dealer along with Yuen. Yuen and Raizu take a walk, where Yuen wonders why he chose to draw his fiance on the scroll. Raizu tells him that he had no choice but to draw the woman he drove to death after constantly seeing her before his eyes. Raizu ends up publishing the drawing under the pseudonym Taishin. Yuen asks about his new identity and also shows him Raizu's new home, claiming that he no longer has to pursue the life of a killer samurai and that Taishin can flourish as an artist. Raizu still has trouble coming to terms with his life. Yuen tells him that he is the only one of the Revengers who can continue life normally, as neither Teppa nor Neo can live in a proper society. Yuen also contemplates what would drive Raizu to continue killing, especially when he has cleared all troubles of his past as if to confirm his loyalty to the Revengers. On his way back, Neo wonders why Yuen chose to go this far for the samurai. Yuen states that he was actually testing him to see if he was going to quit, which would be enough to judge if he lived or died. Yuen also receives another order to be summoned to the chapel. With his acquired payment, Reizu ends up at a bar in the hopes of spending a casual time. A priest shares a table with him, while Reizu contemplates the words of Yuen. Troubled by his own thoughts, Reizu asks the priest if a killer samurai like him can choose to live life with a good conscience. The priest finds it hilarious and tells him that every samurai is appointed and expected to kill. He explains that each person in society chooses to kill with their money, as eating simple food requires the killing of animals and extracting vegetables. The priest makes his absurd claim that there is actually no difference between a girl buying a flower down the street or a samurai whose hands are tainted in blood since money is responsible for all. Reizu finds little solace in his explanation and pays for both their meals before leaving. Yuan is summoned to the chapel, where the high priest tells him that the man known as Liu Wenlin is after the opium hidden in Nagasaki. This time, Yuan is presented with a unique gold slab, which is scorched instead of being bitten. Yuan doesn't know why they have to execute Liu of all people, and in return, the priest only states that he poses a threat to Matsumini's opium. He emphasizes that no other revenger in the whole of Nagasaki is capable of being entrusted with this job, imploring Yuan's team to take Liu down once and for all. In his meeting with the rest, Soji and Reizu are both surprised by the nature of the coin and wonder about the missing bite marks. Reizu and Yuan both have concerns about the chapel's order and wonder if this is how the chapel tests its loyalty. Yuan claims that they're not the chapel's lapdogs, but instead, a team dedicated to their job as revengers. Soji tosses the gold coin to Neo, instructing her to use the same tactic of finding people who can bite the gold coin. Yuan believes that this is a good idea and hopes to learn of the chapel's true purpose. Reizu muses why they're targeting Liu, as although he is after the opium, they have yet to know why. In the next scene, the priest is revealed to be a revenger whom Shishido has summoned. Shishido is well aware of the chapel, which is also working along with him. Shishido offers a payment of up to five gold coins, although they're all faintly bitten. The priest accepts the payment and claims that any revenger is as good as the other. Neo invades Chinatown with the others. The priest and his partner, a marksman, prepare to take their aim. Neo is discovered by Liu and easily caught when Reizu questions him on his motives. The marksman is ready to take his shot while Reizu continues to question Liu on his objective with the opium. Liu doesn't know what he is talking about, and right then, both Reizu and Liu realize that they've been tricked. The marksman pulls the trigger, eliminating Liu right before the samurai's eyes. The opposing revengers end up completing their mission. Both Neo and Reizu are shocked, pondering where the shot even came from. 
Surprisingly, Reizu tells Liu that a doctor is on the way, meaning he is still alive. However, another revenger comes to confront Reizu with the intention of taking Liu. Yotaro is attacked by Soji, allowing Reizu enough time to run away. The priest tells the marksman that their job is finished for today, as they have confirmed how Reizu's team intends to behave. As he is taking Liu to safety, Reizu tells the Chinese man not to follow orders blindly, as he, too, once made the mistake of killing the one that he loved because of Matsumine. Yuan's team secures Liu, and he falls into a state of sleep. He dreams of the mission he was assigned, which was to eliminate all traces of opium on behalf of their ruler. However, the influence of opium grew so strong that it affected even Shue Mei, who was his sister. Tepa reads the story of the surge of opium, which massively affected the people of China. The Chinese also couldn't impose an immediate ban, as it would upset the English merchants who were making massive profits from the deal. Overseas, Liu was placed in charge of the elimination of opium from Chinatown, not knowing much about his enemies. Tepa also comes to inform Liu that he has told Chinatown he is still alive. Liu ponders why they have yet to kill the Chinese man. Tepa explains that they only work on behalf of a gold coin bitten in vendetta. They also have no reason to kill someone wrong on behalf of the Imperial Commissioner of Qing. Reizu shares the idea of joining forces with Liu, who finds it absurd. Yuan provides him with some tea and inquires how he ended up here. Liu drinks the tea and claims that he was here hunting for Matsumine, who was responsible for distributing and circulating the opium across the merchants of Nagasaki. Tepa tells him that Matsumine has already been killed by Raizu, which means his stash of opium is being circulated by another party, which could be the English, or another faction of Qing itself. Liu tells them that they share no involvement in his country's affairs, and they succumb to the state of sleep thanks to Yuan's tea. Soji shares a conversation with Neo, who is struggling in his current life as a revenger. Soji thinks that their jobs up until now have always been simple, and wonders why they couldn't just kill Liu off, especially when the chapel ordered them to do so. Soji is afraid that they've just become the enemy of the chapel. Neo reassures him that worrying won't do them much good, as their leader Yuan would surely think of some plan. Tepa shows impressive deduction skills, believing that the chapel is, in fact, working with the one responsible for distributing the opium. Tepa is also certain that the scorched coin was the chapel's way of checking if Yuan's team could also help in their trade. Yuan states that he is going to confess the truth to the chapel, and in the case that he doesn't return, he wants Tepa to take charge of the team. Liu is in a precarious state and begs Reizu to take him to Chinatown. Reizu reminds him that the act could put his life in danger, but Liu doesn't care because he wants to follow the path of a warrior. Reizu gives in and decides to take Liu to Chinatown. However, Yotaro, along with the opposing party of revengers, has already raided Chinatown to take care of Liu's underlings. They quickly dispose of them in a brutal manner. Reizu and Liu arrive in Chinatown only to hear an explosion. Reizu goes to investigate the matter and finds a crowd trying to put out the flames on the ship. Liu is isolated and gets attacked by one of the opposing assassins. Even in his condition, Liu capably fends off his opponent. Reizu enters the battle for him and orders the assassin to run away. Reizu tends to Liu's fainting condition and tells him that all his men have been eradicated, including those at the port. Liu thinks that his purpose has come to a failure and that everything is his fault. He apologizes to his sister, and in his final few breaths, Reizu tells him to bite the gold coin, giving the revengers a reason to fight for Liu's beliefs. Liu bites the coin in frustration and regret, leaving everything in the hands of Reizu and his team of assassins. Suit pathetically reports his failure to assassinate the half-dead Chinese man. The priest is unhappy with the outcome of this mission, and comes to meet with the chapel nun, who announces that Yuan's group is no longer affiliated with the chapel. Shishido also blames Raizu's group for causing havoc in Chinatown and dirtying their name. Shishido intends to bite more gold so as to use his own team of revengers for his deeds. In the next scene, the culprit is revealed to be Shishido, who has been using Matsumini's stock of opium and making Nagasaki his stage of amusement.
Shishido also believes that Liu was too much of a fool in the end for trusting the trade union of Nagasaki and wonders what kind of face he would have made after learning the truth behind his demise. Isarizawa tells Yuan that Reizu's conflict with Liu in Chinatown has stirred up a lot of problems since the magistrate is now primarily targeting the Revengers. He also informs him that Shishido is acting as the trade union's general. Yuan presents his deduction, claiming that it was the Nagasaki Trade Union who plotted Liu's demise and destroyed his men in Chinatown. Isarizawa allows him to realize that Shishido is the culprit behind the scenes. Neither of them knows the reason behind his actions, leaving Yuan to investigate the matter on his own. On the other hand, the assassin explicitly targets Soji's apartment. Raizu and Soji know that they can't stay at Hana's place any longer and decide to run elsewhere. The following day, Shishido summons various craftsmen to observe the final unfinished work of Tenzin, an artist who recently passed. Shishido points out Yusui for the job and thinks that he should beautify it with his lacquering skills. Yusui declines the offer in an open rejection, claiming that a fellow artist shouldn't taint an unfinished piece of art. Directing their attention to Raizu's painting of Yui, Shishido tries to provoke Usui, stating that the original artist of the painting must be someone cruel for drawing a girl who no longer exists. The lacquer artist tells him that Taishin must be capable of coping with grief in his own way and expressing it as a beautiful painting. Switching the scene to Teppa, Neo and Soji both take space at his clinic because they are being targeted. Neo is bored and wonders if they're going to get any revenge jobs at all. Soji states that it would be impossible now as they have directly picked a fight with the chapel. Teppa also reminds them that their boss has actually gone to the chapel, a fact that shocks Soji, who wonders if their leader is even alive. Teppa claims that it was important to report the matter of Liu's death to the chapel while also returning the gold coin. Soji leaves in frustration to waste his money on gambling. At the chapel, the foreign priest voices his complaint against Yuan and his failed execution at killing Liu, but wants to glance over the fact because the Chinese man ended up ultimately dying. Yu encounters, stating that someone like Liu was only fulfilling his mission to ensure the eradication of opium instead of obtaining it. He questions why there was such a need for that person to be a target of revenge. Yu also states that he met Shishido and accuses the chapel of working with the Nagasaki Trade Union General. Yu states that a man like Shishido doesn't feel a grudge and only finds satisfaction in the miseries of other people. Even though the foreign priests try their best to persuade Yu the saintly assassin tells him that Shishido is only going to distribute and circulate Matsumini's opium. Yuan shows him the bitten gold coin left by Liu, stating that Liu's vendetta remained strong until his final breaths. He entirely believes that this has placed a responsibility on the shoulders of the Revengers to act against those who took everything from him. Saying this, Yuan leaves, as if to say that he would go against the chapel and the Nagasaki Trade Union for Liu's cause. Yuan returns to speak with Reizu, who feels more reassured, having chosen his path as a revenger. He is grateful to the man in front of him for giving him another chance at life. Reizu has made it his duty to put an end to this matter, even if it costs him his life. When Yuan asks him what he wants after, Reizu states that he will disembowel himself as a samurai. Yuan tells him that he can still continue his life as Taishin, to which Raizu agrees, as it would be a direct confrontation to the sins that he has committed in the past. At the gambling den, Soji is stunned to discover the same nun from the chapel rolling out in the game of gambling. Soji joins the game, but she ensures he wins every single round as if he were the luckiest. His friends praise him for being so good at amassing a fortune, but Soji feels uneasy and leaves. On his way home, Soji wonders about the intention behind the nun's appearance and whether his leader is all right. The nun meticulously steals his deck of cards and begins to make a fool out of him. Soji still doesn't know what is going on until she bluntly questions why they're harboring the notorious samurai Raizu, who was supposed to be dead. Soji claims that he doesn't know the reason, as only Yuan would know why. The nun orders him to find out the reason claiming that she has already given him the money necessary for the job. Soji is left frustrated in the night, not knowing what he has to do with any of this. Reizu walks around Chinatown as if to give his opponents an easy target. 
Suit questions why his companion isn't shooting him down. The marksman states that their position might get exposed upon shooting him, causing them much greater trouble, as Rezu is acting like bait for the other's intervention. Sharing a meal with the nun, the foreign priest wonders about her progress with Yuen's group. The nun questions why he doesn't just use the other revengers against Yuen's team. The priest states that he wants to preserve their strength for the times ahead, as they want to indulge the whole of Nagasaki with opium, catching the attraction of the English merchants and wreaking havoc upon their world. After he meets with Isarizawa, Yuen is called by Teppa, who reveals that Soji has something to share with them. In the next scene, Soji begins by questioning if they really ever went to Satsuma to avenge Hirata's death, whom Raizu killed. The main concern for Soji is the fact that after Raizu struck down Matsumine, Neo signaled the death on their behalf, indicating that the bell was for someone else as Hirata had already died. Soji also discovered that Yui had a special hairpin that she wore even after her death. Yuen explained that he had made the hairpin at Hirata's request. In his flashback with Hirata, Yuen is the one who tells Hirata about the group known as the Revengers, adding insurance in place of his death. Hirata claims that he doesn't care for the killer coming after him, and instead wants his mission to succeed in his place. Yuen confesses in front of Teppa and Soji that he is the one who delivered the hairpin to Yui in person while reporting the death of her father. Soji wonders about her condition during this time. Yuen relives the experience, as Yui was in a devastated state and already knew that Matsumine never directly killed her father. Because of her curiosity, Yuen ended up telling her that it was a man known as Kurima Raizu, not knowing that he was actually her fiancé. Yui is struck by a sudden shock, coming to terms with this horrifying yet frustrating realization. Yui's condition is unlike any other as she curses Reizu, questioning their experiences together. She dreads him and continually lashes at him. Back then, Yuan told her that even someone like Raizu would inevitably receive karma in revenge. That is when Yui makes her vengeful desire, the desire to have Raizu killed for her father's death. In fact, her coin was bitten unlike any other, and Yuan received it in kind. Yuan shows the coin to Soji and the others, who realize that he took pity on Raizu, making the samurai a special case among the others. Soji claims that in the end, it only jeopardized the Revengers as they picked fights in Chinatown, the Nagasaki Trade Union, and even the chapel itself. Soji presents the idea that they should rethink their decision and take out Raizu. Teppa wonders if he means after Shishido's affair, but Soji doesn't really care as he knows that their job as a revenger takes priority. Teppa reminds him that Raizu deeply regrets his own doings in the past, making him a difficult case to judge. Soji states that they have never thought of people in such a way before taking their lives. Soji emphasizes that they can't glance over the deeds of the samurai and leave them be. After his meeting, Soji is told to keep an eye on Raizu in case he goes berserk. Reizu tells him that he is intentionally walking around in broad daylight for his enemies to notice, allowing Neo freedom to act on the side. Soji reminds him of Lu's death as the bullet came out of nowhere and didn't leave even a sound. Reizu tells him that it will be Soji's responsibility if it comes to that. But he still wants to prioritize Lu's revenge, as the bitten gold is their oath. Soji faces difficulty grappling with his words and contemplates taking him down on behalf of Yui's gold coin. However, Raizu suddenly dodges an incoming bullet and exposes their position. Soji is worried to see Raizu get shot, but the samurai shrugs it off as the bullet only grazes his mortal flesh. Suit observes that there hasn't been any movement from Raizu's end. The marksman contemplates what Raizu and his team are planning. Yuan reports that a single ship cruises off every night and has sent Teppa and Neo to investigate the matter. Yotaro takes his sweet time, but soon discovers that Neo is a spy from the opposing party. Neo has already made a success out of his role by discovering the existence of an island. Teppa helps Neo escape from the ship. Later, Yuan comes to meet Raizu, who is painting more of Yui's drawings. Yuan has already told him about Soji's erratic behavior and Raizu acknowledges the damage he has caused by being a part of their team. 
He doesn't feel angered that Soji lashed at him in such a way. Rezu states that he draws without even thinking, no different than him wielding a sword. Yuan shares that it is still a surprising development, as someone like him should be incapable of wielding anything but a sword because of his previous life. Raizu questions the worth of his life and wonders why his existence matters at all. Yuan tells him that he can find solace in his life by forgiving himself, as eventually, God forgives all. That night, their mission to end Shishido's schemes once and for all finally begins. Soji finds it unbearable at first, but eventually, he eradicates his concerns for Reizu and reunites with the group. The team moves as an unstoppable unit to act in the will of others. The Revengers march ahead. A group of men questions why they have to dock at the shop on the strange island each night. Their curiosity gets the better of them as Teppa shoots his arrows, which are armed with explosives, and warns the men to jump into the water. The ship explodes at once, forever destroying their enemy's retreat. Neo and Yuan take care of more guards around the mansion. Reizu begins his assault with Soji and Teppa, casually fending off dozens of men on their own. Their primary target is the location of opium, which seems to be hidden in a cave. Suit reports that only three of the Revengers are disrupting their plans, but their leader knows that the rest are probably busy taking down Shishido at his mansion. Neo happily dismantles a great number of men while finding great joy in the activity. Yuan also defeats his opponents with his special powers. However, a ferocious tiger in the wild is thirsty for blood and takes on Yuan and Neo. Meanwhile, Soji, Teppa, and Raizu are aware of their enemy's location and know for a fact that their marksman is eyeing them. Raizu wants to play the bait, but Soji tells him that they'll give him two targets at once and gamble on them. Raizu and Soji come out in the open, where Soji dodges the bullet. However, when Teppa aims, he finds that it's actually Suit who fired the first bullet. The real marksman confidently takes his shot, wounding Teppa as he falls to the ground before firing his arrow up into the sky. Yotaro deals with the samurai in a battle of steel, but Soji sees through his trick and uses Yotaro's own weapon against him, killing their opponent. The marksman is ready to take another shot, but that's precisely when Teppa's final arrow descends from the sky and impales him in place. Teppa pities the marksman for only using guns to shoot linearly, which is the drawback of such weapons. Raizu is given the green signal to move ahead, while Soji takes care of Teppa's wound. Raizu charges full speed ahead, and he finds the priest he met at the bar, realizing that they're fated to come to this battle. Yuan and Neo fend off the ferocious beast. The animal falls into Yuan's trap and becomes food for the deadly piranhas in the pond. Returning to Raizu's final battle, he wields his blade and makes his first advance, which the priest blocks. Reizu believes that Lu is much stronger than his current opponent. However, he is quickly overwhelmed by the priest's weapon, finding himself in a pool of blood. The priest is confident in his victory and wonders if Reizu has any last words. Remembering their conversation at the bar, Reizu reminds him of his point regarding the value of the coin, which circulates murder. Reizu corrects him by saying that the gold coin is not judged by its currency, but rather by its bitten grudge, which becomes a duty for the honorable revengers to fulfill. The priest laughs in his face for believing in such a tale, but Raizu finds himself motivated and pushes his opponent back, prepared to die on any day while betting his life. The priest tries to make his escape and orders Suit to take the fight. Raizu dodges Suit's bullet and plunges him with the blade of the priest, leaving Suit to die in frustration. The priest crosses the bridge and destroys it, believing it to be enough to stop Raizu. However, the samurai refuses to stop and makes the impossible jump, slicing the man in half while also discovering the hidden opium merchandise. Over Yuan's end, Shishido claims that he isn't worried about his death because he knows that someone like Yuan only wants to steer death and destruction in the world. He offers Yuan a chance to share the opium so that they can stir more chaos in the future. Yuan doesn't really find himself aligned with such an ideal. Shishido pulls the trigger on him, believing that it is enough to take out the Revenger. Yuan casually dodges the expected move and places a sheet of gold in his mouth, 
before chanting his incantation to finish him off. Shishido dies a gruesome death, decimating his face as he plummets to the ground. The group sets the whole of the opium merchandise with explosives, permanently ridding Nagasaki of such a drug. Soji returns to Hana and the others, who wonder where Raizu is. Yuen reports the matter to the chapel, claiming that those who were Liu's enemies have now been dealt with, as they have succeeded in their revenge. The foreign priest acknowledges that this will indeed restore peace in Nagasaki, although for a temporary time. He continues to offer Yuen another job as a revenger. After their mission, Teppa, Soji, and Yuen stand atop the same place where Raizu was first ambushed and thought to be assassinated. They confirm the fact that he died as he will no longer live as an exposed existence under the name of Kurima Raizu. Yuen also tosses Yui's gold coin into the river. We are shown that Raizu has continued to work on his illustrations and his life as an artist without wielding a blade. He has made it through the winter months and doesn't draw anything but the anguish encapsulated in his wife's expression. Back at the art dealer, the people discuss the impressive ability of the artist Taishin. Neo also tries to observe the drawing, wondering if Reizu picked any other subject to draw. She finds herself disappointed that he still remains the same and draws Yui. On that fateful day, Reizu once again comes under the same bridge from the beginning, reminiscing the memories he shared with the others in his life. However, Reizu quickly feels a sharp stab in his back, as Suit feels happy having gotten the better of the samurai. Reizu simply turns around with a warm smile as if he accepted his death. Suit begins to weep and becomes overwhelmed with fear before running away. Reizu pulls out the blade and inspects it before tossing it aside. He limps and finds himself sitting under the same bridge after suffering such a precarious injury. Reizu's final thought is of Yui as he dies on his own from the same place where he started his journey. Usui Yuen, once again meeting the samurai in his death, comes to collect Yui's hairpin from Reizu's hands.